Astronomy to GCSE, Topic 2.3, Solar System Discoveries. So 1. The contributions of Copernicus, Tycho and Kepler to our understanding of the solar system. So how did Copernicus aid our understanding of the solar system? Well, the Polish astronomers said that the celestial objects, rather than orbiting the Earth, orbited around the Sun. This is called a heliocentric model of the solar system. Helio coming from the Greek word sun and centric coming from central. Tycho was a Danish astronomer. This is a link to an image of him. I'll put it in the description. Tycho collected a large quantity of data from his naked eye observatory on the island of Heaven near Copenhagen. Sorry for the pronunciation. Tycho suddenly died in 1601 and then the mathematician Johannes Kepler, Tycho's assistant, used the data to come up with his three laws of planetary motion. 2. Kepler's second law of planetary motion, but to explain it I'll start with his first law. Kepler's first law of planetary motion you should have already heard of, as it is each planet moves around the sun in an ellipse, with the sun at one focus. If you can't remember what this means, I will do a diagram. An ellipse is a very precise shape. It is not just an oval. It is the shape achieved by fixing two points called foci, which is a plural of focus, and wrapping a loop of string around them, and using the limits of the string to draw a precise curve. This link, which I'll put in the description, shows you a video of someone drawing an ellipse using this method. The first law of planetary motion means that the orbit of each planet is an ellipse, not a circle, and the sun lies at one of the two foci, a point where the string is fixed to. Kepler's second law of planetary motion is a little bit more difficult, so we'll start from the beginning. Kepler noticed that the planets do not orbit the sun at a uniform speed, but instead move faster when they are nearer the sun and slower when they are farther away. This change in speed is very precise, so much so that say a chosen planet is observed and then again a fortnight later, the line joining the sun and the planet will sweep out equal areas during equal intervals of time. As the planet's orbit is an ellipse, the length of this imaginary line which joins the planet and the sun changes. This length depends on the planet's position in its orbit. Now the law is that the area bound by the two lines from the sun and the part of its orbit is always the same, so long as the time between the observations is also the same. This happens no matter at which part of the orbit the planet is. So in order for the area to be the same when the planet is closer to the sun, it must move faster to sweep out a larger arc. So area 1 is equal to area 2. Remember, this is only true if the intervals of time are the same. So it could be a day, a week or a month, it doesn't matter as long as it's the same. You may be asked to explain Kepler's second law by drawing, so try and remember this picture. So back to the definition. The line joining the sun and the planet sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. That's Kepler's second law of planetary motion. Three. Kepler's third law of planetary motion. This law was made much later, but is just as interesting. Kepler's third law of planetary motion is the square of the orbital period of a planet is equal to the cube of the mean distance. This is a bit easier to understand once you know some terms. The orbital period is the planet's year, so the length of time it takes to do one orbit around the sun. Mean distance is the average distance between the planet and the sun. For Earth, it is exactly one astronomical unit. So the planet's orbital period, or year, squared, is equal to the mean distance cubed. So the third law says that the length of the orbital period of a planet squared is equal to the mean distance of the planet cubed. This law only works if the unit for the orbital period is Earth years, and the unit for the mean distance is astronomical units. 
any other units for time and distance, and this doesn't work. 4. What are the discoveries of Galileo? These are only ones that relate to the solar system though. You only need to recall these so it's just like remembering a list, but it's best if you understand a bit about them. Just so you can get a perspective of time, Galileo was after Copernicus, but alive at the same time as Tycho Brahe. The phases and apparent size of Venus indicated a heliocentric solar system. This discovery of Galileo helped to give more evidence for the proposal of the heliocentric solar system by Copernicus. Galileo was not the only person at the time to be looking at the moon through a telescope, but he was the first person to link the different apparent colours of the moon to its relief. He recognised that these different colours were due to the lunar mountains and craters. Finally, the principal satellites of Jupiter. He noticed that there were some small bodies that were close to Jupiter and sometimes they appeared to disappear behind Jupiter. Soon he concluded that they were orbiting Jupiter. Galileo had found the principal satellites of Jupiter, Callisto, Europa, Ganymede and Io. This gave more evidence for a heliocentric solar system, as these objects did not orbit Earth, as, we, as it was previously thought that all objects orbited Earth. 5. The discoveries of Ceres, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. Ceres. Ceres lies in the main asteroid belt, between Mars and Jupiter. In fact, Ceres is the closest dwarf planet to the Sun. Ceres was discovered by Giuseppe Piazzi, an Italian astronomer in 1801, at his observatory in Sicily. When Piazzi was doing some observations, he noticed a faint object that moved on successive nights. Piazzi thought he had discovered a comet, but later, when its orbit had been determined, it was confirmed that this was a new planet. In fact, it is now considered a dwarf planet. It was the first asteroid known to astronomers, though. Uranus was discovered by William Herschel, a British astronomer, in 1781. Herschel was an amateur astronomer and discovered Uranus, which he believed to be a comet, using a telescope of his own design. Once the orbit of Uranus was determined, it was found that the orbit was too circular to be that of a comet. The discovery of Neptune is a little less simple than the previous objects. Strange wobbles in the orbit of Uranus were spotted, which the gravitational attraction of the inner planets could not account for. A British astronomer called Adams began to calculate the position and mass of this object, which disturbed the orbit of Uranus. Independently, but at the same time, French astronomer Urbain Le Verrier started to do similar calculations. Le Verrier sent a letter to an astronomer called Johann Gottfried Galle, urging him to point his telescope at the predicted position of this new planet. The discovery of Neptune in 1846 is now attributed to Le Verrier and Galle, since they precisely predicted and found it. The discovery of Pluto is quite famous. Strange wobbles were found in the orbit of Uranus and Neptune, which led astronomers to believe that another body was affecting the orbits of these planets. The search for the new planet began. This job was given to American amateur astronomer Clyde Tombar at the Lovell Observatory. A blink comparator was used to compare subsequent images of the sky. A blink comparator can be used to find moving bodies. A blink comparator compares subsequent images of the sky, such that a body that has moved can be found. 6. Gravity and the inverse square law. Sir Isaac Newton proposed these laws. Gravity is a force between objects with mass. Anything with mass will attract anything else with mass. This force of attraction is proportional to the product of both masses involved and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the objects. If the masses are greater, then so will the force be between them. However, if the distance is x times greater, then the force will be x squared times smaller. So by doubling the distance, the force will decrease by 4 times. This is the inverse square law. It is gravity that holds us to Earth. 
all of the planets in orbit around the Sun and in fact causes the Sun to form in the first place. That is the end of Astronomy to GCSE Topic 2.3. Thank you very much for listening and watching.